All right. Um, for mobile device security, it's kind of important we all know what the heck the Internet is. You all agree with that? Yeah. Okay. And I also have a book. I put the first chapter up there. Everybody see the, the book? Mm -hmm. It's up there. I actually have the whole book, by the way. I told you I will provide whatever you need. But we're going to talk about some of this stuff. And I have some videos I want you all to watch. And I'll explain them when we get to them. But the book is actually, I don't know if I have the cover on here, but it's um, Jones and Bartlett's Wireless and, Network, Wireless and Mobile Device Security, which is about the best book I could find for this course. Okay, So we're going to talk about some of this, watch a few videos, and have a discussion about it. Okay. Data communications. You all realize we did not have the Internet years ago. Is there anyone old enough that didn't have the internet when they were a kid? Okay. I mean, we didn't. I mean, you actually had to go to a library. You know, when I first was working on my schooling, I think I graduated my bachelor's in 95, so years before that when I was working on my degree, I actually had to uh, take a course, mandatory, called library skills, where you actually had to go to the library, pick a topic, any topic, and find 20 sources. No two sources were the same type. In other words, one book, one newspaper, one magazine, go for 20 different types. I mean, nowadays, can you imagine telling a student to find 20 different sources of like, okay, I went to Google, I went to Yahoo, I went to Bing. No, it's, it's tough. But back then, there was no internet. And we actually had encyclopedias. I remember that? Uh, then we went to, I think it was Encarta, the Windows 95. And now it's, does anyone even have encyclopedias? Do they even make encyclopedias? I mean, printed copies anymore? The problem was they weren't updated. But okay, they started off with Telegraph, okay, years and years and years ago. Um, by the way, this book does not come with um, PowerPoint slides yet. It's a brand new book publishing this year. They literally released the PDF of the entire book last week. So it's brand new. So it's somewhat updated, which is kind of nice. But they started off with Telegraph. And you know, uh, Sears, you know, Sears is not gone, but it's not like it used to be. You know, Sears and Roebuck, how they actually started? Has anyone ever heard that story? You know, they used to sell heroin, by the way, and morphine. and <laughs> They all did. I mean, they all did. Oh, yeah, this magic pill, morphine. Yeah, it fixes anything. Yeah, it's morphine. Okay. <laughs> but uh, Sears and Roebuck actually worked for the railroad, and they needed a way to, you know, timing and stuff like that. Back then, they had the whole Morse code thing through the telegraph system. But they started selling stopwatch, uh, not stop, the pocket watches. So he, he told her, hey, I made, you know, I got this cool watch. And the guy's like, dude, can I have one? He sold it to him. Then he ended up selling them to everybody on the railway system. And that's Sears and Roebuck. That's where they started. So it was kind of cool. But they started off years ago with um, um, telegraphy. Then they started with telephony. Then they, years later, we ended up coming up with the, pu the public telephone switch network system. Okay. Does anyone still have a home phone? One of you? Okay. It still amazes me whenever you... technically you, but I turned it into a fax machine. Oh. But so many times when you're, like, signing up for something, what's your home phone? Like, seriously? No one has a home phone anymore. We have these. Okay. Well, we have the public switch telephone system. And I, when, when did uh, the Tinker hit, t the, the tornado hit Tinker? Was that in 95? Yeah. Okay. I remember in 95, I was home with my youngest son, Micah, and Eileen, who used to be my wife, you don't know that. Eileen was at the grocery store with Nick. You were talking about the one that took out the horse stalls. Right, that one, yes. Okay. She was at the commissary shopping. And a tornado came, and they actually put them all in the freezer in the commissary. Luckily, they didn't stay in there forever. But I lived on base, actually right by the Tinker Gate that got wiped out. And it was weird. Our room, our, our living room had a uh, stupid closet in the middle of it. We're always like, why is there a closet in the middle of the living room? Well, it's a concrete line closet. So it makes it great for a tornado shelter, except when we got done, we climbed out of the closet. I looked on the shelf, and I had all my bowling balls stacked on the shelf. I could just imagine <laughs> all these bowling balls only on our head. But we climbed out, and you know, the, the winds were swirling in the back room there uh, outside my house, and the house was plastered with trash. But it didn't get wiped out. But I called my grandma after that. And, I mean, she was trying to call me, and I was trying to call her, but we couldn't get through. Why couldn't we get through? Everybody's trying to call everybody. Everybody's trying to get through. And back then, when I called my grandma in Connecticut, I actually made a connection from Oklahoma to Connecticut. And I was the only one that could use that connection to that entire time. And there's a limited number. Because they think, it's like, I used to work at an ISP, you know, Internet Service Provider. Remember, kind of like AOL dial-up kind of stuff. And 
Does anyone know what the number of users per modem was? So for every user they got, how many modems would AOL or CompuServe have local? Okay. It was usually between 20 and 50 users per modem. So that's why you get some busy signals. Because if you had 20 people assigned to one modem, obviously if 20 happened to dial in, it was busy. So we, we only had 10 people per modem, which means we never had busy signals, which was good. It was good. It was a really good selling point. But the point is you only have so many lines. Can you imagine if you had 500 subscribers and you actually had 500 modems? I mean, you'd be going broke. But back then it didn't matter because no one was on the Internet for like we are now. But back then you used to dial up, do what you want to do, then hang up. Y'all remember those days? Okay. And sometimes you accidentally left it on, but then your mom couldn't call you. And I got the kind of phone, that kind of stuff. So, okay, but we had the public switch telephone network, which worked good for years. And parts of it are still there. Okay. All right, so it was, you know, it was, I said it was, it was huge. They didn't come up with the early data networks, okay? They figured out, you know what, we need to start connecting stuff together. Okay, yes we do. Because it's a... That's actually the meeting I was having downstairs with Roy and Arlene. So we need to connect at least this machine to the Rose network. Because when I make uh, you know, a gigabyte recording, it's pain in the butt to get it downstairs to put it up on YouTube. Okay? Does anyone remember Dunn terminals like this? Some of you might have seen those. I mean, really, really old stuff. That's when I actually learned computers. I took a data communications course, and we actually used those. Okay? So, you know, they, they started with fat, you know, Fax machines were out way back in 1962, and we're still using them today. You know, a lot of places consider a fax machine as a secure mode of, trans of communication. Um, it's, it's crazy. Like, I cannot email something to somebody because it's not secure, yet I can fax them. Like, why? Why is that even a secure mode? But it is. Then they come out with modems. Now, I put a couple videos up here I think are kind of cool. Okay? I put a couple different modems. See if you can... Remember the sound, okay? This is a 300 baud modem. Come on. There it goes. Who has never heard that? I mean, actually used the computer that had that. Some of you. Okay. Who has not? I mean, who did never use dial-up? Okay. But, you know, that's pretty much... What you heard, if you ever picked up the receiver, kind of crazy stuff. That's 300 baud, and then we got 2400 baud. I mean, that was like crazy fast. Okay. And obviously, there's that many people watching this video right now. Seriously. 2400 baud was very popular. Don't even tell me. YouTube's gonna die on me. We're gonna have a discussion if it does. Okay, maybe your modem's oh, there we go. All right, I reset it. Okay. This is 2400 baud. You all see the lights on it? We used to have to, you know, are you getting, you know, activity light or do you have a connection light, so on and so forth? And they connect. And you pretty much listen to that forever. There's not that much difference in the sounds of them. Here's 56k. I don't know why that guy's face is on. This looks like something Roy would make. I don't know why I have this for me. Then it would basically go on forever. All right, so, you know, we had these sounds forever, but, you know, modems were nice. I mean, some of you did use modems, okay? And I remember when they first came out, you know, I used to be a member of a bulletin board out in the New Wall area. You know Chuck Norris is from here. Do you all realize that? It's from here. I think it's from Hera, if I remember right. Is it Hera? I think it is. I mean, somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, I used to use a bulletin board that Chuck Norris would actually use as well. That's back in the Windows 95 days. Does anyone remember Windows 95, what happened every Thursday? It's when they come up with a new release of Windows 95. Because they would always release a new release on Thursday. What I would do is I would download it. It came in in like 20-something disks, 23 disks if I remember. A bunch of floppy disks. 
then I would upload them to bulletin boards. And you got credit for uploading. So I would upload all 23 of these to a bunch of bulletin boards. And I get all this credit so I could download. Back then, you would have to upload before you could download. I mean, it was a ratio. I mean, if you download one meg, uh, or if you upload one meg, you could download two megs or something like that. Yeah, it was, it was kind of weird. And then actually someone <laughs> on that same bulletin board, right before it started going away, someone found out that you could dial into this bulletin board, and then I think it was hit nine to make an outside call worldwide, toll free. This guy ended up going out of business because someone figured this out, posted it somewhere, and all of a sudden his phone bill was like astronomical, and he went out of business. It was kind of funny. But uh, modem stands for modulate, demodulate. It takes digital data, that's the ones and zeros, converts it to analog, which is the sine wave. You all seen, hopefully, pictures of that. And then tr transmit it across the phone system. Then on the other end, the sine wave, the analog is converted back to digital and the computer uses it. So what happens if in the middle of that, someone picks up a phone or something? A lot of time you drop the call. Not always, but a lot of time you would drop the call. Okay. Was anyone ever ever heard of ISDN? Integrated Systems Digital Network, if I remember right, which is strictly digital. Um, I remember they used to, whenever there was a, an ISDN line connection, there was a big sign. Do not plug your analog devices into this because it would fry them. The voltage is different. It would actually fry your computer, your modem, or your whatever your phone you're using. But ISDN was strictly digital. And it's actually still used today, believe it or not. It's an always-on signal. It has a 2B plus D, which is two data lines and one signaling line. Uh, you know how like some places only have DSL now? But you're limited to about five, three to five miles with DSL. I understand it really has no limit. So you could actually be 20 miles out and have a digital network using ISDN. Uh, so it is still used today. But that's the digital version of a phone line. When I worked at the IS, ISP, we sold ISDN as well. It was funny. We had a not constant ISDN where nobody you could use it. You just couldn't be on 24 hours a day. And it was like, you know, 50 bucks a month, whatever. I don't remember what the price was. But if you wanted a dedicated one, it was like 300 bucks a month. So there's a very big difference in price structure. And it was funny because this one company had the, you know, not the dedicated, but they could use as much as they need, but not dedicated. They had their system set up to dial in at 1 in the morning, stay on until midnight, <laughs> disconnect. Then they have to do their backups. Dial back in at 1 in the morning, and we were like, dude, that's a dedicated connection. No, it's not. And we had a big fight over that, and then, you know, it was kind of crazy. But Okay, so we had modems. Modems used our regular phones, phone lines. Does anyone want to try to use a modem over IP or over, like, voice over IP? I ever get a voice over IP phone, try to use that for a modem? Not so good. The reason is that's over what's called the, the switch network, packet switch network, which we'll talk more about in a minute. But sometimes packets come in out of order. Sometimes the packet's missing, has to be retransmitted, and it causes a really big issue for that. Okay? So we, we started, you know, actually, here's where they talk about packet switching. Actually, let's talk about that here for a second. So we talked about circuit switching, how... If we have circuit switching, that's when I call my grandma. I have a dedicated connection to my grandma. Okay? Y'all get that. Packet switching is, imagine going to the grocery store. Okay? And I'm buying a bunch of stuff. And I put everything in one bag and carry it all out. That would be very hard, wouldn't it? Y'all can imagine that. But what if I took that and broke it up into separate bags? And then a lot easier to carry out. And what happens if I drop the bag with eggs in it? I lose the eggs. It breaks the eggs, but does it break the milk and everything else? No. So packet switch solved the problem of a dedicated connection. Because, you know, even when I was talking to my grandma with that dedicated connection, was I really using the full bandwidth of that connection? No, because there's pauses in my voice. And plus, my voice doesn't have enough frequency range to require the whole connection. So that entire time I'm talking to her, I'm wasting space. For packet switch networks, it takes your data, or your phone if you're using voice over IP, puts it in the chunks and sends those chunks across the internet. What's cool about those is they can do, go different routes. Does anyone remember a few years back when I-40 bridge got knocked out over the Arkansas River? It was after, what, six months? 
I think they routed everybody through Gore, if I remember right. But can you imagine if your instructions say I, take I-40 East, no deviations? What would you have done for six months? You'd be sitting there at that bridge <laughs> waiting because you can't turn. Packet switch networks, that's also called source routing kind of thing, but packet switch gives us the ability to, hey, the bridge is out. Go through Gore. So, and, and it's kind of cool. It gives us the ability to route over different ways. So, packet switching is really cool. They also mentioned down in here how things were expensive. Okay. Can you imagine? Actually, Rose State used to have a dedicated connection to Tinker Air Force Base in Building 201 East, which is the education center. Because we have an office there. They used to have a dedicated connection between Rose State and there. I don't know what it cost, but they were darn expensive. Now, they just have a regular internet connection with a VPN. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Which means now we're no, you know, we no longer have a dedicated connection. We're just using internet like at home, but we have a VPN, which is a virtual private network, which still allows for good secure communications. I actually installed the VPN from Chapel Supply. They don't sell church stuff. They sell pressure washers. I installed the VPN from Chapel Supply to... Edmond, uh, and then I installed one from there to uh, Dallas. No, actually, that one's for the insurance company, but I installed the VPN years ago. This is probably right around 2000. Back then, the stuff wasn't all gooey. There was a lot of command line stuff. They were using a speed stream VPN router. I don't know, that probably very expensive. Well, they couldn't figure out how to get it to work, so they hired me to come in and do it. I charged them $600. So to connect... The insurance company downtown to Edmond, I charged them 600 bucks. Took me a couple days. Because there was a lot of configuration that had to be done. But what I did is I actually made a script. Because there was a lot of command line stuff. So whenever I figured something out, I added it to my script. That way I could, well, that didn't work. I could edit my script until the point where we got it to work. So I got it to work in a couple days, charged them 600 bucks. And they're like, dude. It was only like two or three days, and you charged us six hundred dollars. I says, "Yeah, but I did a lot of work on it." But you did. I said, "Many, many hours on it." So they ended up paying me. So I'm like, "Okay, now you want me to connect to Dallas, the one to Dallas?" They're like, "No, no, that didn't take you long enough. I'm sorry, we can't pay you six hundred bucks." I'm like, "That's what the cost is." Like, "No, no, no, we'll we'll just do it ourselves." I said, "Fine, do it yourselves." A week or two later, they called me back to like, "We can't get a door." <laughs> You want me to do it? And I said, what are you going to call? I said, $600. Like, All right. So I said, give me a couple of minutes. So I went into my script, changed the Edmund name to Dallas, hit enter. Oh. There you go. And they're like, what? It's 600 bucks. They're like, so it was uh, very entertaining on my behalf. But, uh, you know, it's the way things worked back then. You know, that's what you get paid for to figure things out. And uh, I also broke a password once for an accounting person. It's nothing pertaining to this, but. Y'all know what QuickBooks is. If you had a QuickBooks file that was password protected, what would be the first thing you tried? Password. Well, okay. I mean, I, we didn't know what the password was. What would be the first thing you would try to break the password? You go on Google and type in QuickBooks password breaker, which I did. Downloaded it. Add file, password broken. It's like five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> like, okay, that was tough. So I charged them 150 bucks. But by then, I'm like, and that $600 deal, they were pissed because I did it too quickly. So I said, for 150 bucks, I waited about two days. I'm like, finally got it broken. Here's your password, 150 bucks. So it was pretty funny. I, don't, I know, it was, it was funny. Okay, but a lot of time, you know, we had a lot of downtime. So you could rent a connection. You could rent a dedicated connection. Or nowadays, I don't know anybody who actually has a dedicated connection anymore. I don't know. I know. One of my friends, he had direct lines into his house. His parents wanted to hold on to him. Wow. So they had like five direct lines into their house because it's like sentimental. They were paying so much for wow. it. We, we used to sell ISDN lines back then. Not T1 lines, I'm sorry. They were $1,800 a month. And we had this mother and son. I don't know what they did, but they were on the internet all the time. They paid $1,800 a month for their T1 line. The problem is they'd go on chat lines and piss people off. So when people would attack them, they would actually be attacking us because we were their ISP. So they'd be attacking through us, would take us offline. So I remember we'd call Cox at 2 in the morning and say, hey. So they'd come out and they'd block like an entire networks from Europe 
just the point where we could get our connection back up. And it was, still don't know what they did with that, but it was, it was kind of crazy. All right. So they talk about how packets are digitized and separated and all that stuff. And that's pretty much what I already talked about. But packet switching is great. Okay. Then they came out with the internet. Okay. I have a couple short videos I want you all to watch here. All right. The history of the internet. Y'all, y'all okay watching the short video, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. Kind of interesting. Even Roy liked this one. The internet in the year 2009. We send emails, make calls over the internet, and discuss topics we take an interest in. Even our banking is going virtual. But what we take for granted today old, by the way. was only a vague idea 50 years ago. In order to understand how we got <coughs> this far, let's go back to 1957, when everything began. Before 1957, computers only worked on one task at a time. This is called batch processing. Of course, this was quite ineffective. With computers getting bigger and bigger, they had to be stored in special cooled rooms. But then, the developers couldn't work directly on the computers anymore. Specialists had to be called in to connect them. Programming at that time meant a lot of manual work, and the indirect connection to the computers led to a lot of bugs, wasting time and fraying the developers' nerves. The year 1957 marked a big change. A remote connection had to be installed so that the developers could work directly on the computers. At the same time, the idea of time-sharing came up. This is the first concept in computer technology to share the processing power of one computer with multiple users. On October 4th in 1957, during the Cold War, the first unmanned satellite, Sputnik 1, was sent into orbit by the Soviet Union. The fear of a missile gap emerged. In order to secure America's leading technology, the U.S. founded the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in February 1958. At that time, knowledge was only transferred by people. The DARPA planned a large-scale computer network in order to accelerate knowledge transfer and avoid the doubling up of already existing research. This network would become the ARPANET. Furthermore, three other concepts were to be developed, which are fundamental for the history of the Internet. The concept of a military network by the RAND Corporation in America. The commercial network of the National Physical Laboratory in England. And the scientific network, Cyclades, in France. The scientific, military and commercial approaches of these concepts are the foundations for our modern Internet. Let's begin with the ARPANET, the most familiar of these networks. Its development began in 1966. Universities were generally quite cautious about sharing their computers. Therefore, small computers were put in front of the mainframe. This computer, the interface message processor, took over control of the network activities, while the mainframe was only in charge of the initialization of programs and data files. At the same time, the IMP also served as interface for the mainframe. Since only the IMPs were interconnected in a network, this was also called IMP subnet. For the first connections between the computers, the network working group developed the network control protocol. Later on, the NCP was replaced by the more efficient transmission control protocol. The specific feature of the TCP is the verification of the file transfer. Let's take a short detour to England. Since the NPL network was designed on a commercial basis, a lot of users and file transfer were expected. In order to avoid congestion of the lines, the sent files were divided into smaller packets, which were put together again at the receiver. Packet switching was born. <laughs> In 1962, American ferret aircraft discovered middle and long-range missiles in Cuba, which were able to reach the United States. This stoked fear of an atomic conflict. At that time, information systems had a centralized network architecture. To avoid breakdown during an attack, a decentralized network architecture had to be developed. 
which in case of loss of a node, would still be operative. Communication still used to work through radio waves. That would have caused problems in case of an atomic attack. The ionosphere would be affected and the long wave radio waves wouldn't work anymore. Therefore, they had to use direct waves, which, however, don't have a long range. A better solution was the model of a distributed network. Thus, long distances could be covered with a minimum of interference. Another milestone followed with the development of the French network Cyclades. Since Cyclades had a far smaller budget than ARPANET, and thus also fewer nodes, the focus was laid on the communication with other networks. In this way, the term Internet was born. Moreover, Suclade's concept went further than ARPA's and the MPLs. During communication between sender and receiver, the computers were not to intervene anymore, but simply serve as a transfer node. Suclade's protocol went through all machines using a physical layer that was implemented into the hardware, providing a direct connection with the receiver, an end-to-end -end structure. Inspired by the Suclades network, and driven by the incompatibility between the networks, their connection gained in importance everywhere. The phone companies developed the X.25 protocol, which enabled communication through their servers, in exchange for a monthly basic charge, of course. DARPA's transmission control protocol was to connect the computers through gateways and the International Organization for Standardization designed the OSI reference model. The innovation of OSI was the attempt to standardize the network from its ends and the channel's division into separate layers. Finally, the TCP assimilated the preferences of the OSI reference model and gave way to the TCP IP protocol, a standard which guaranteed compatibility between networks and finally merge them, creating the Internet. By February the 28th, 1990, the ARPANET hardware was removed. But the Internet was up and running. Alright, I think that's it. Alright. So what do you think? Kind of a cool video, gives you an idea of where this whole thing started. Oh, now? It should just say Finn. Oh, I know. It should. <laughs> now, um, I did add some other videos. We're not going to watch them here today. But these are pretty awesome. Okay, especially at the beginning here. And we'll show you a little bit here. They start talking about... Very loudly. Hackers are the outlaws. How this whole... It's, it's got Kevin Mitnick. It has Captain Crunch in there. It has, I think... No one has a... Where's it at? The intellectual challenge. And there... And that's where hacking began. Talks about not, yeah. open up his room. Like tones, getting in was easy yeah. with the right equipment. It came in the shape of a free gift in a packet of breakfast cereal. Yeah. Made twenty six hundred right herbs. Here, a Captain Crunch whistle, and if you glue this hole right here, like this, that's twenty six hundred. When you blow the whistle into the phone. A little cheek sound, that's the acknowledgement coming in from the other side saying, you're ready to process the call. It's like putting oh. money in. Squads were replaced by Questions. mechanical systems. This is Different noises interested. were used to trigger the switches. If you had perfect pitch like blind phone freak Joe and Grecia, you could whistle calls through the network. showed off his skills for the local media. He has his one phone to a town in Illinois and back to his other phone, a thousand mile phone call by whistling. Joe Ingressia says he used to do these things because he is fascinated by the technology. All right, but I mean, there, I put a bunch of videos up there. It's a five part series. Excellent, you should really watch them. We just don't have time to watch. There's a couple other DEF CON videos up there. I don't know if you've ever seen these. 
very interesting. This is about how don't steal hackers' computers. It's just hilarious. I think it's from two years ago. But watch some of those videos. They're really interesting. I'm not requiring them. I just think it's a good idea for you to watch them. Okay. So um, let's talk about more about the Internet. So it started off, as you saw, with the ARPANET. It was originally computers at colleges. And they said, you know, we... You know, we can get the military involved, and, you know, and it was really used for the military. You know, the military does have special networks all over the world. Right. It's like when I was in Saudi Arabia multiple times, I was able to call home basically any time I wanted for free if there was an availability on the line. But once a month, I think, or maybe once a week, they gave me an actual dedicated time where there was time reserved for Ken Dewey. But the rest of the time, I could just call and hope the line was free. So I'd call my wife and say, okay, I could talk, then you just get cut off and... You know, the line got busy, but yes. Okay, so, okay, when I was in the Navy, okay, we had huge satellite districts. Right. Okay, that, you know, trains right. with the ships and everything mm -hmm. else out at sea. So, if those signals were, you know, interrupted, then that means they got nothing. Right? Well, yes. I mean, it, even though they're a really secure. Right, I mean, if the satellite, I mean, it's just like a storm here. If you have dish network and there's a huge storm, what happens? You get nothing. But uh, a lot of the times back then, you could, you'd could you have to schedule. you say, okay, I want to make a call on Monday at 3 p.m., and for the next time period, it was dedicated, so I had a dedicated slot. I would never get interrupted. But the rest of the time, you know, that line, it's like a T1 line could actually handle 23 phone lines. I don't know if you know that. An actual T1 line could handle 23 lines, okay? So if, Imagine there's a T1 line from Saudi Arabia to Tinker. It means there's 23 phone calls can go at one time. When it was Ken's slot, when I would reserved it, one of those is mine. But all the rest of the time, you know, say there's only 18 people on, the other five were available, and if you just happened to dial in correctly, you could use them. But I never got cut off via weather, cause, but I'm assuming at one point they did have to go through satellite. I don't know. You know again, it's been years. I might have got... Who knows? Some of the times they got cut off might have been due to what you know, said. I was on the coastline and when I was in the Navy and over in Jacksonville, Florida, yeah. and they had regular satellite dishes, but they also had some real funky looking yeah. satellite dishes. Yeah, they all kinds. Okay, so we had internet, and the internet they mentioned TCP/IP. Um, you know, TCP/IP is not really fast. I don't know if y'all know that, and it's not secure whatsoever. Okay, I talked about one of my other classes. I see TCP/IP was made to connect computers, like they said. But when they first started this, do you think anybody was worried about security? No. I mean, did you ever do something in your house and just to get it to work? I'm gonna go back and fix it later, but you never do. I mean, when I built my house, I put a in every room, in every wall of every room, there's a. Uh, RG6 for coax, there's a CAT6 for network, there's CAT5 for phones, and then there was an intercom wire. To every wall in every room in my house, there's 27 different connections. And I did that, you know, I, I had the house built, so I actually added it before the walls were up, which actually made it very nice. And they all go to a centralized closet. You have patch panels like this in my closet, okay? And what was cool about it is when I first moved in, I'm like, okay, I'm going to use that one right now, and that one, and that one. So I hook, hook up those three but the rest of the 27 wires never got done. And I finally did finish them years later. But that's what TCP IP was. They got it to work. They didn't think about security until years later, okay, which is kind of scary. And, you know, there was other protocols out there. Um, uh, IPX SPX. Some of you might have heard of IPX SPX. It was very popular on the Unix-based networks. Uh, not Unix, Novell network. Actually, much faster than TCP IP, much, much, much faster. It has so many capabilities, but that's not what they chose. So people are like, why did they choose it? Well, because that's what they chose. I mean, someone picked and said, we're going with TCP IP, and then we've been stuck with it ever since. It's just the fact that they picked such an unsecure model kind of sucks. Betamax uh, was the best. What? <laughs> Betamax was yes. the best video. Yes. Uh, I, was, uh, I have an example. Um, say I'm going to build a bank. But, you know, so I have a choice. Uh, I can you know, go down the street and buy an old 7-Eleven that's going out of business, make it into a bank. How good would that be? Not very. Why wouldn't it be good? I'm just big enough. I bought a big 7-Eleven. Why wouldn't that be a good bank? 
no vault. I'm assuming the walls are probably wood. So the ceiling. So the odds of securing that bank are going to be very tough. That's what TCPIP was. TCPIP was a 7-Eleven. We're trying to use it for a financial network, yet we're using a 7-Eleven for our building. So what would be better would be to actually build a bank from the ground up, and that's what IPv6 is. They're actually thought about security. There's so many flaws in TCP IP. And I have videos up there if you want to watch them. That's fine. But there's so many flaws in, I, in IP4 that you fix in IP fi IP6. So you all do know we're out of IP addresses. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. We ran out, what, 2001, I think? Some more, not 2001, 2011. I don't know. We ran out a few years ago. There's no more IP addresses available in the entire world. So how the heck are we continuing the function? It's funny because I watched a video on the internet. You know, everything on the internet is true. It's yes. very true. It's very There's true. no lie on the internet. Especially Wikipedia. It's like gospel. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I watched this video about this guy. says, yes, you know, we ran out of IP address, which was true. So we were being forced to switch to IPv6, which means every single piece of hardware in the entire internet is going to have to be replaced. I'm like, What? The cool thing about T or IPv6 is it's 100% backwards compatible. So you can use your old system with the news. I was watching the video, I'm like, who are you? Are you a woman idiot? Yeah, I don't know what he was, but it was. But I mean, I think I thought it was one of them joke videos. It wasn't. He was totally, yes, you know, it uses all this new stuff and our old computers can't support it. So we're going to have to get all the new ones. Yeah, you have to get devices that support it. But all that means is your home router has to support it. It doesn't mean your laptop internally has to support it because your router can translate between IPv6. And you can actually go to, I think it's called Hurricane Electric. Not positive. You can get your own personal IPv6 number. I think it's Hurricane Electric. Let me go look. Let's find that. Or is it right? I know I spelled it wrong. Hurricane Electric. Internet server. I think that's it. Because you could go on here, the tools that allow to get certified, global, but you can actually get an IPv6 number. Free IPv6 tunnel broker. So you could go up here and get your own personal IPv6 number. So, I mean, it's yours forever. So no matter where you go, you could use this. Uh, what's kind of cool is, like we got this phone right here in this, in this classroom. I have the phone in my office as well. They use voice over IP, which means the phone is using the regular real estate network to work. Okay, What happens if I take my phone in my office and plug it in another building? What do you think? Still work. Still work. My phone will now ring in a different building. It's like I used to have Vonage. I loved it. When I, when I ran my ISP at my house, I had Vonage, which was awesome because you know I could just bring it wherever. And a friend of mine who also ran another ISP had Vonage as well. And he moved to Mexico. You know how with Vonage you pick a phone number and you could call anywhere basically in the United States for free. Well, he moved to Mexico. His number still says Oklahoma on it. Oh, he's so in he's in Mexico, but he can still call anywhere in the United States for free. Because it doesn't, it goes by what your number is. It doesn't go by where you're at. So you can actually take that number to, you know, Australia and call Oklahoma for free. It, it's kind of cool. All right, but if you want to get an IPv6 tunnel, there you go. Hurricane Electric is the place to go. All right, so we got this TCP IP. It allowed us to have communications. TCP IP is secure, but not the entire thing, okay? TCP IP is a protocol suite. has TCP and IP. TCP is the smart part. IP is the stupid part, okay? Just because I can take an envelope, I mean, those things at home where you write an address, put a stamp in the corner, just because they take an envelope at home and write the correct address on it, that's IP, does that mean it's going to go to the correct place? Yeah. Oh, no. So what makes it get to the correct place? The delivery service, the postal people, you would hope they deliver it to the right location. Uh, back when I ran my business, it never failed. UPS, at least weekly, would deliver a package for a guy like five doors up. It's not a big deal. I'd walk it up to him. It was like consistently there was always and what sucks is you get home you get a package you open you're like i didn't or oh crap it's not even mine but it was i live at 8412 it was like 8212 so always having to walk it up there too 
finally got tired, so I called UPS. And they're like, what's the problem? I said, you know, I got a package, deliver it to me, but it's for my neighbor. Can you just walk it over? He says, no, I'm tired. I'm not walking over there. Because you do it all the time. I mean, consistently, every week there's a baggage. It's like, what do you like to do? I'd like you to drive out here in Choctaw, pick up this package and drive it five doors up and drop it off. And they're like, seriously? I'm like, yeah, it's the only way. And ever since that day, they never did it again. What it was is the delivery driver was like, ah, it's close enough just to take the crap. And, but it was, oh, it was terrible. But okay, so TCPIP started. They even mentioned ISDN line there a little bit at the bottom there. So kind of a cool stuff how this stuff all started working. And then we started getting frame relays in ATMs, not the money dispensing kind. Asynchronous transfer mode actually started giving us very, very fast connections, okay? And what frame relay is, and they, you're kind of you're kind of paying for a connection like a dial-up connection, but then the connection, but once you dial up to get to the other spot was ex excessively fast. It's kind of like a highway. I mean, we could drive like the other day there was an accident at Douglas and I-40. Turns out the accident was there, gone pretty quickly. I didn't know that, so I went from Rose State to Chata on 29th Street. Stopping every, you know, right during rush hour at 4.30 and it took me a while to get home. Well, the point is I was on back roads. The highway's much faster. The highway's like frame relay. It's very fast. Once you get onto the highway, you can zoom where you're going. Now, Roy, do you drive on the highway yet? Huh? Do you drive on the highway yet? Yeah, I drove the, on the highway to get the car home. That one, but have you driven on there since? Yes. Really? Yes. Okay. Really? See, Roy just got his driver's license at Christmas. Well, you're 28? 28, yeah. 26? 28, you're close, closer. Well, he's like 26, and he just now got his driver's license, and he drove on the highway the other day for the first time. Kind of scary, isn't it? Oh, yeah. All right, so we had frame relays. Then you start talking about wide area networks. You, know, you saw in France where they had these smaller networks. Then they said, you know, we got these small networks. We need a way to connect them together. That's what they started working on. That's where the whole Internet came from. And that's pretty much... What a wide area network is. It's a wide area. They also have things like metropolitan area networks and campus area networks. It's just semantics. Someone, you know, would say, okay, so how many computers do you have to have before you're considered a wide area network? Well, there's really no number. Okay, it's not like, okay, 1 to 12 is a LAN, 13 to 18 is a campus area. Eight, no, there's no such thing it's just how you but normally a wide area think of like UCO they got a Stillwater office in Oklahoma City office I say that's a wide area network okay so point to point connections between them gave us high speed um, it's like uh, y'all know what the Pike Pass system is they know how the Pike Pass system works so my old instructor my very first networking course helped install it his name is George Floyd he works down at OSF office of state finance he uh, helped install that and they had a really big issue installing the Pike Pass system because the way it works is when you go through the toll gate, whatever, it scans your device, your pass, and actually communicates through systems up in Tulsa. At least it did. I don't know if it still does, but it did. Transmits to Tulsa, checks your balance, then comes back and says, thank you, or Pike Pass account balance low. Anyone ever seen the account balance low? Anything on there? Okay. I've seen it once in a while. And it usually happens to me when you forget to update your credit card. Now you give them a credit card, it's good for four years, and you forget to update it. And crap. But when they installed that system, they had an issue, because fiber, you know, is a bundle of cables. Well, they had gophers that were eating into the cable, and they were eating all the red fiber. He didn't know why, but it was just the red fiber they were eating through. I don't know how they fixed it. I don't even know if they did. Well, I'm assuming they fixed it. But back at the end, he'd come into class, and he's like, Man, I was out all day fixing fiber, and he's like, they don't know why. They're just eating the red fiber. I mean, we're thinking underground, in the dark. How do they even know it's red? <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay. All right. Yeah. What else? It, it, it could be. It could be. Okay. So we have a lot of technologies out there. I mean, we had Apple Talk. We had Token Ring. You know, Token Ring is a very excellent technology. Anyone know what it's really good for? Well, it's really good for banking. The reason is token ring is kind of like me saying, okay, it's going to go for each one of you. It's going to continue to go around this room. And it's going to go to a certain speed, no matter what. So it's very good for timed applications. Because Roy knows he's going to have the token or the ability to communicate every X number of seconds. 
Whereas what we have here, this ring network, yeah, we can all communicate, but it's kind of like whoever communicates first. You send your packet out, and if there's a collision, everybody stops. Yeah. Right. What happens is, so this network right here, so um, Ben Chell over here sends a packet out. Whoa, there's a collision. So the entire network stops for a second. It's like, whoa, 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 there was a connection, there was a collision. So it actually pauses. It pauses for a random length of time based on a 32-bit number. I can't remember what, but, um, but it's based on that. So we all pause, then we start communicating again. So there's a lot of collisions of the network. Is that a bad thing? Well, yes, but no. It's fast enough where we really don't have big problems with it. But with Token Ring, it goes around... And you know, you don't talk until it's your turn. You ever seen like in school, shut up until it's your turn. That's what token ring is. Okay. But the problem with token ring is what happens if there's a connection over there in the wall? A break. It's broken. And can't get there no more. It's kind of like takes the entire network down. Unless you have dual rotating rings where it goes the other way, which is a whole other story. Um, but the ring network is actually much, much better. Okay. And they actually showed on the video where this, the, the systems started to allow communications through them at the physical layer. That's what we have now. Okay? Packets can go through machines, but you only act upon it when it's directed to you. Okay? That's based on your MAC address. Okay? We have ways around that, like with Wireshark and stuff like that. But you really don't do anything with the packet unless it's destined for you. Okay? So we started getting personal computers. What was the most expensive computer someone bought? What did you pay for it? Okay, but that was recent. I mean, yeah. good thing. Of, how about long ago? I remember buying a two eighty six something or a Tandy, I think, for three thousand dollars. Had like one meg of memory in it, and I upgraded to sixteen megs for six hundred dollars. We're talking mm -hmm. megs, not gigs. Mm -hmm. That was expensive. Back Right. It was. I mean, it was like, wow. I mean, everyone know, you know, I'm, I'm always buying new stuff. But, you know, I bought the new iPhone. Obviously, the best phone. We all agree on that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Since I give the grades, we all agree on that. Now, um, <laughs> point is, this phone in October was the best on the market. At least in my opinion. But what's going to happen a year from now? It's going to be another one. There's always something new. Obviously, will that point become the best phone on the market again? But the point is, there's always something new. So, when do you upgrade? Two years from now. When you realize, <laughs> when you realize that your phone still sucks. <laughs> but, you know, I had, you know, when I used to run my consulting business, I had a company called Dixie Air Title Service. I, I took care of Dixie Air Title Service and Aerospace Reports. They, ha they both handle aircraft titles. Like, when you go to buy a plane, you want, it's just like a house. Who owned it before you and you, blah, blah, all the way down the line. Well, they took it. Dixie Air used e-machines. And wonder what an e-machine is? It was actually a disposable computer. If you bought an e-machine at Best Buy with a warranty and there was any issues whatsoever, guess what happened? Throw a trash, here's a brand new one. They were disposable because the parts were that cheap. Then we had Aerospace Reports who listened to me and bought what I told them to buy. It's funny, Dixie Air is always having issues. Always. Aerospace never had issues. And finally, I talked to Dixier, oh, no more e-machines. But you know how Dell was sending that flyer in the mail, get this awesome computer for three seventy nine. That's what they bought. Like, yeah, it's not an e-machine, I agree with you. But you get what you pay for. If you pay $2,000, guess what you get? $2,000. The machine is worth $2,000, and it functions, and it works, and it's going to be there. That 379 machine, yeah, it's going to work, and it was much better than the e-machines. But it was kind of still like an Android. It's kind of slow and not so good. Okay, Whoa, so, <laughs> all right. But, <laughs> so we started getting personal computers, and everybody started getting on the Internet. Okay. I mean, I, is anyone taking Bill Richards' Linux class this semester? Well, he's back as an adjunct. If you haven't taken Unix Linux, make sure you take it with him. He is like... The Unix Linux God. He knows everything. He lives and breathes Unix Linux. I remember back in the around 95 time period, he used to work at Tinker in building 284, and the, he was a flyer. He, he was in charge of the network in that building, and I was working on networking in another building. And I remember going to his office and surfing the, surfing the Internet. I mean, the entire Internet. 
That's back when Mozilla Point Zero Nine came out, the very first web browser, and it was like five websites. So we surfed the entire internet Mozilla that morning. Mozilla Point Zero, you mean Netscape? Whatever it was <laughs> that back then, it was like way back when. But we started getting personal computers. That's when they had mainframes back there, and yeah, we still kind of have mainframes, but not so much anymore. Uh, they're not really mainframes anymore, but you know, we, we still servers. have more powerful servers than what we have. Okay. The, 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 the set, wheel. The wheel. Yes, the it was. Wheel. Yes. Okay. All right. So, but we, we started, you know, computers connecting to mainframes through a LAN, which is a local area network. Then we started with mobile phones. You know, I brought a mobile phone over here the first day, that bag phone. Those were popular for a very long time. The and they're, you know, I'm not saying anyone uses that anymore. But, I mean, is there anybody here who has a non-smartphone? I mean, it's literally probably a flip and you dial and that's it. Wait, it has one or uses one? Uses one. Is them. All right. But there's people out there that still do that. That still use those phones. I use that pink razor okay. forever. Yeah. But they, they, they connect via different ways. Okay. And they, they start talking about the advanced mobile phone systems. They get into, you know, CDMA, which is pretty much what Sprint did. Sprint still uses CDMA? No. Okay. I couldn't remember if they did or not. No, they switched off of it and okay. started going to the newer technology. Okay. But CDMA, I mean, when I had Sprint years ago, that was awesome. It was really pretty quick. Those are really the first generation phones. It was like you could start getting text messages. You know, text messages way back then, I mean, it didn't. First, does anyone know where text messages travel right now? I mean, not iMessage. We're talking regular SMS messages. It's not really going through your bandwidth. It's really going through the signaling part of the phone. It's kind of like the same part that caller ID goes over. So that's why it's like, why are they charging us for that? Because we're not even using bandwidth. So how come sometimes you get text messages six months later after someone sends it? Email is the same way. Because the signaling network is so much slower. Yeah, it, it's very slow. Very, it's, very yeah. slow. And, you know, it, and it's not just that. I mean, people get letters five to ten years later, too. It can I've get gotten a lost. birthday card two years late. So what happened? You know, it is, but okay. So we got GSM, which was good, and uh, you know, does anyone wonder where one of the best cellular networks is right now? According to the, the commercials, or like <laughs> actually, <laughs> it's actually in Europe. Yeah, well, Europe and Japan. Right, Europe Japan is amazing. Best. Europe, if you get a cell phone in Europe, you can use it in Europe. I mean. The entire Europe. I mean, it's going to work in the cow pastures. It's going to work in the buildings. It's going to work in the basement of your house. It works everywhere. Because I went over there on a cruise, and they were right. My phone literally had a perfect signal everywhere. Uh, what they did is they got rid of some of the old crap. Like, you know, do we really need to support the 1G systems and the 2G systems anymore? No. And, uh, you know, I have a car with OnStar in it. Anybody have OnStar in their car? Okay. Uh, Oh, that's handy sometimes. It's great if you get lost and someone steals your car. But uh, point is, OnStar uses analog phones. And we're talking the old, you know, 2G phone system, which sucks. And for the longest time, they wouldn't update it. And I kept asking, why? <laughs> why? And they're like, well, you know, when you're out in the middle of nowhere, really that's the only thing that works. And that is true. Because those really old phone systems function. The newer digital ones, yeah, like T-Mobile. Has anyone got T-Mobile? One of you. Okay. I went on a church trip with a youth group a few years back, and we went to uh, Fort something in Illinois. I forget the name of it. And it was funny because most of the kids had T-Mobile, and I had AT&T. We get to this place, and none of the kids' phones works. Their entire youth group, none of their they're all dead. <laughs> and I had perfect signal. The reason is T-Mobile was pretty much on the... On the interstates, but that's about it. But take I-40 to Tennessee. If you're driving through Arkansas, you have no service. Okay, I live at I-40 in Choctaw Road. Okay, I live just south of I-40. Did you know from about 104th Street all the way to Lake Thunderbird, that eight miles, there's no service for T-Mobile? It's like, wow, that just sucks. It's like, but in Europe, you know, problem is T-Mobile is not using the same stuff that we all are using. They don't have agreements on the right towers, and they haven't updated everything. So little by little, like LTE is the deal right now. Okay. We have LTE here. You all know that. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, you go to Houston, 
They have LTE as well, but oh my God, is it faster? Yes. But the biggest problem is, is a lot of the a lot of the companies though, cellular yeah. companies, they say they can say they have four G. Yeah, but they don't. But they're they're just they using somebody else's tower. It. It's just they turn the volume up. Basically. Yeah, it sucks. But Houston, I'm I was down in Houston a while back, and it's like. Dude, my network is like so much faster than it is here in Oklahoma City. But things are changing. So Europe, everything's been updated. They got rid of the old crap. And the problem is if there's an old tower and a new faster tower and you happen to have a connection to the old tower and it's still in range, you're most likely going to stay on the old tower until you get far enough away where the new tower. So that's why your signal comes and goes when you're driving around. Okay. All right, and there, yeah, there's still a lot of places out here with crappy signal. Okay, so we had some 2G pretty much gone now they start talking about sms sms i mean how many people actually make a lot of phone calls on their phones but i very seldom ever make a phone call. it's so much easier especially with an iphone because it does voice translation for you i mean everything about this is great but now <laughs> i get nothing to do but uh, i talk in it all the time it's like, it does translation for you. but we all send sms's it's very good I mean, it's nice. I just wish it was totally free. Okay. They talk about wireless local area networks. You know, I was talking to my stepson yesterday, and we were talking about Wi-Fi or something. He's like, so what is Wi-Fi? I says, you know, that's computer connection. He goes, so that's Internet. I'm like, no. <laughs> Wi-Fi is the connection to the Internet. Because his, my stepson's dad, he's an idiot, by the way, he, uh, <laughs> no job, he sleeps and smokes. That's it. Sleeps till all day long, smokes cigarettes when he's awake, and then that's what he does. No oh job. Can't find a job. He did apply to be a dishwasher at Sonic, but they did not accept him. Oh. That was like three years ago, so he's been sitting at home all this time. So good role model for him. But he's like, you know, I was telling him, your dad has Wi-Fi. He does. He has a Wi-Fi router. He goes, but, internet, but there's no internet. I'm like, I know, because Wi-Fi is the connection to the router. Then that router needs to connect to the internet. I mean, that's another story. So I don't know if he kind of got the whole thing here. But, you know, Wi-Fi is really just a connection. It is getting more popular. A lot of places. Did you all see the Marriott got fined, like, tons of money for blocking wireless hotspots? It's just in the news. See, I have a, a MiFi, a local Wi-Fi hotspot. I have it because when I, I do a lot of mystery shopping for gas stations and stuff, and... I have to, my pictures transfer better when I have Wi-Fi because they sync when my Apple system is better. So I use my Wi-Fi, which gives my phone Wi-Fi access even when I'm out and running around. But Marriott's was blocking that. They were trying to say, oh, it was for security reasons. No, it's because you're blocking it so that people would have to buy your Internet. So, yeah, it was, it was in the news like yesterday or the day before. This got fined a whole pile of money. It was, it was pretty awesome. Okay. So now we got computers. We're all connected via the LANs, wireless LANs. And I tell you, a lot of people just don't know what the heck that is. Okay, I'm going to try to get done with this chapter. We're almost running out of time. Okay, so you started talking about the convergence of mobile and data. Is there, is there any apps out there that are really awesome? Like, anyone ever go to Five Guys? They're awesome. Have you ever used their app? It's awesome. I mean, you can put your credit card information in there and save it. But you go in and select what you want. It's super easy, and you say, I want to get it from the Norman location and order. And it's like, it's easier than going to the cash register because it's like, I want the little bacon burger with lettuce, tomato, onions, jalapenos, order. Done. And you get there, and it's ready. It's like, wow. But there, that's the point we're getting. It's so much easy. It's going to be easier to do more stuff on the phone. You know, I have a Nest thermostat at home. Yeah. And it sends you updated it. I like their online thing. Sally just put it in the oven. You know, the oh, pizza yeah. tracker. No, <laughs> your phone actually sends you messages. Like my friend shared it does a picture. And it, it, your phone will actually send you a message saying, like, my friend shared a picture of Jesus was delivering his pizza. So. <laughs> I like that. That's good. But, yeah, it's pretty good because I was in Dallas. I think last spring, and I did a pizza. We did the pizza tracker. It's funny because it's like, okay, Sam is now delivering your pizza. I said, okay, so many miles away. And I said, it could take me exactly five minutes to get here. And I opened the door to the hotel room, and he walked up. I'm like, oh, dude, that was sweet. <laughs> Perfect timing. Okay, but we're getting to the point where all this stuff is working together. Okay, 
our mobile devices are now connecting to regular networks, you know, and they work great. Um, does anyone realize your mobile phone does change addresses as you move around? Okay. Okay. Just make sure you all knew that. We'll, we'll talk more about that, just not at this point. Okay. They talk about SIMs, subscriber information modules. Uh, a lot of phones have them. Actually, most phones have them now. Some store more data on them than others. And that's actually a very good thing for forensics because SIM cards sometimes store a lot of data. You can get all kinds of stuff off of there. What now? Yeah. So I said, in the past, like, a lot of them, more are getting them now, but, you know, it's, I don't know, it's different. Okay, but now they start talking about LTE, which, which is the most common one, okay? And it's pretty fast. I don't know the exact speed of LTE now, but it's darn fast. Yeah. So, you know, hell, I remember when 3G came out, I was thrilled to death. But then it's one of those things. Great. It's great. And now my phone's a year old. And there's a newer one out there. Someone's already talking about the iPhone 7. It's like, seriously. Don't even put that up because that means you got to read it. That means you got to start drooling over it. So he's it's already, terrible. He's, he's still <laughs> obsessing over the iWatch. Oh, so. I am literally ready. Well, Take that, my money. What about the iRing? There's, there's I don't know. I saw something I about that. It's not from Apple. No, if I say the it's one. Is. It's the one ring to control all your apps. All, all your Apple devices. But I'm ready. The moment they tell me I will hand my money, here, take credit card, whatever. I'm not getting the gold one. I'm paying $1,200 for a stupid watch. Uh -huh. But I will, well, now there's a limit. <laughs> but I will tell you to take my money. Okay. I want to say LTE is about, I don't know, uh, 100. Times better? Yeah. All right. But there's a lot of different networks out there. And, you know, they're talking, you know, challenges. What about people bringing stuff into the network? Is that an issue? They start talking about here in a second, but they have this thing, bring your own device. Places are starting to do that. That's where the company no longer has to buy me a computer, but they allow me to bring my own and do my work. Is that a vulnerability? Yes. Yes, yes it is. Yes, it is. When I uh, went to the University of Tulsa, almost out of time, but first time I plugged my computer in the University of Tulsa, it pops up and says, checking your computer. And mine was updated, which was good. But when Eileen went to Tulsa, she was missing, I don't know, an update or something. It's like, your computer is quarantined for one hour. And it, it only gave her the ability to do Windows updates and update her antivirus, which was kind of cool. It provides links to update your antivirus, to update Windows. Then at the end of the hour, it checks it again. Then if you're still not correct, it's like, okay, we're going to give you another hour. <laughs> the third time, it turns off your port, automatically spits a help desk ticket. And they come over and fix it for you. Wow. That's well, kind of cool. It's insulting. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, but think about it. You know, the other day, room 122 downstairs, we got humanities in the building this semester. He calls me in there because, dude, the computer's not working. So now was, I'm here early in the morning, so I went down there. And I said, dude, it's not turned on. He goes, oh, okay. So I turn it on. <laughs> then it boots up, and I said, okay, log in. He goes, what? I'm like, I did control it. I said, log in. He goes, why? I'm like, to get on the computer. <laughs> We don't do that in our building. I'm like, you have to. I found out they don't. They're auto-logged in in the humanities building. They don't know how to log in. The guy's like, so what do I use? I'm like, you're a network password? He goes, well, what's that? I'm like, okay, do you have email? Yeah, I have email. That. Put it in your email stuff. But the point is, there's a lot of people who don't understand this stuff. Okay, so that causes an issue. Okay. We're about out of time. We'll go over the rest of the chapter. You know, they start talking about how mobility starts working. And... We're going to do some more next time, but uh, watch some of those videos if you get a chance. They're kind of interesting, and uh, there's like a bazillion more of them out there. But then, yeah, we'll, we'll cover a little bit more about addressing and how the nodes work and everything next time, too. Okay. The British Everybody... sitcom series that they're discussing the Internet and it's a box. Oh, I've seen that. Uh, yes, yes uh, I've seen that. Uh, all right, and since it's water. one time good deal, since I skipped out on you last time and had lunch, what if I brought pizza next week? Would that be nice? Absolutely next, acceptable. I next Wednesday. Now, lobster. now after I said that, I did schedule lunch with my wife today, That's this morning. An then I'm on the way here and says, wait a second, <laughs> I got class. <laughs> so assuming I don't forget next Wednesday, I will bring pizza. Okay. I demand lobster bisque. All right.